Last time I was in San Antonio was 35 years ago, and I think I was drunk on the Guadalupe River. <laughs> it's been that long. Um, hi, everybody. I want to explain my cell phone snobbery. Um, see, I don't have one. I've never texted. I've never been on social media. I've never tweeted, twatted, whatever it's called. I've never <laughs> been on Snapagram. I've never... And here's why, because I love my fellow human beings and everyone I love, everyone I love, my children, my wife, everybody, my family, everybody is on, everybody is attached, everybody is in a damn trance. <laughs> and I, so, you know, I was on a book tour, I think it was for Tony, and um, I'd be reading something really painful, like my sister being sexually assaulted, and I'd look up and I'd see someone doing this. I mean, who knows, maybe they're texting someone, hey, get down here, you should you know, be here, but it was probably, I don't know, get me mochaccino. <laughs> and I would take it, I took it for like 12 cities, and then I, and then I stopped, and, and I said, you know, um, we're only here for a short time, and I mean on the planet, Earth. And, um, I, I, you know, I was taking 25 minutes up, up, up at the mic, and what I was reading was really personal. I said, you know, F this, I didn't say F. Kind lady in the red jacket, four rows back. I don't mean to publicly shame you in any way, but what you're doing right now is hurting my feelings, and if you keep doing it, I'm not gonna, be, I'm gonna shut up. I'm not gonna talk anymore. And I said, I'm not, I'm not suggesting I'm the only important person in this room. I'm no more important than anyone else, but just treat it like you have to go to the bathroom and do it out there, because <laughs> we're here for a short time. Let's be present. All right, I'm gonna get very personal, if you don't mind, and, um, I'm going, to re I'm going to talk, my favorite part of getting up in front of people, I love that Q&A. Uh, so let's get to a conversation. But I do want to um, just talk a little bit, and I'll read just a little bit from that accidental memoir. And I'll read another little something, a, a short essay I wrote, and then let's have a conversation. And thank you for having me. Um, so you don't have to have read this book or know anything about me, but I've got a life like a lot of people. Um, probably... At least half the people in this room come from a broken home, because that's the statistic in our culture. My mother and father eloped. They're all from Louisiana. By the way, I don't have an accent because we moved there when I was about nine, but all my friends talk like this over here. How you doing, honey? You look awesome. <laughs> Go Sox. And um, my parents are from Louisiana. Every blood relative I have is from South Louisiana. And when my mother was 18, she went to her her father, my future grandfather, who was a third grade educator pipe fitter from a rice farming family. And she said to her dad, I am eloping with this man, Andre Debus from Lafayette, who was barely 21, my future father. And he said to her, my grandfather, well, there ain't been no damn divorces in this family. And if this don't work out, you ain't coming home. And nine years and four kids later, it did not work out. Um, they split and and I watched something happen to my my mother that I bet you've seen in your lives your friend with a couple especially if you're older than you know with friends for decades they split up and now you're only hanging out with Alice you still love Tom where's Al or where's Tom or you're only hanging out with Tom well how's Alice how come I, I didn't divorce Alice how come I never see her anymore somebody in the group gets dumped and my mother got dumped. And let me just explain a little bit about my mother. She was movie star gorgeous. She was a beauty queen, beauty pageant winner when she was a you know, young woman in Louisiana. She wasn't just physically beautiful. She was charismatic, creative, deeply intelligent, charming, funny. I mean, lights up a room. Even now, all these years later, she lights up a room. And... Um, because of what her father said to her, there's no way she's going to pack up these four kids and go home. And so she has, she's 2,000 miles north. She has no parents to turn to, no siblings to turn to, no aunts or uncles to turn to, no cousins to turn to, and now she has no friends. She's 27 years old, 28, and um, she has no job and no education. And that's how our adolescence began. Uh, so I've got an older sister, Suzanne, then me, then my brother, Jeb, my little sister, Nicole. And we're all within like five years. She had five, four kids in five years. So my mother went and did what so many women have to do. She, she, she went and did it herself. She 
got work as a nurse's aide and then a waitress. And she began to work her way through college. And she got a degree where the big money is in social services. <laughs> Although I'm very proud of her for that. And she began what turned out to be a 30, 35 career, year career working with mainly poor families like us. Um, so we moved a lot, and we moved a lot for cheaper rent. And, and Alexandra was describing a little bit where I grew up, but the Merrimack River runs west to east along New Hampshire, Massachusetts border to the, to the ocean. And in the late 1800s, it was um, just a beehive of economic activity because all the ships would come down to the mills from Europe, and it was a, a prosperous place. But then, you know, world economics came in. And in my town of Haverhill, Massachusetts, the Italians started to import much better, much cheaper shoe soles, and, it, and that was 90% of their business and went belly up. So we moved to that town in the early 70s. At the time, uh, it was boarded up. It was one of these towns where the mills had no windows in them. It was just rotted plywood. There was a bar room on every block. Nobody seemed to have a job. A lot of the fathers seemed to be gone, and if they weren't gone, they seemed to be under the grips of some addiction, or two or three. And, and I remember it just feeling like a cruel, dangerous place. And, uh, and sometimes we would move three times. One year, we moved three times. It's always, it was always for cheaper rent. And, um, and you guys, I was a physically small boy who liked to read and would use adverbs in daily speech. <laughs> yeah. I was a target. And I'd be sitting on the stoop, you know, so we, the bus would come at 7.15 in the morning, and, and um, my siblings and I would, would go down the stoop, and it'd be, this is the early 70s. Now, I'm, 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 I'm 58 years old, so I'm a member of the generation that's 10 years, 10 years younger than the Vietnam generation, 10 years older than Generation X, wherever they are, and they're old now. Um, <laughs> right, so we had hair down to our waist, we wore leather jackets, uh, dingo boots like Joe Namath wore, although, although I didn't know who Joe, Joe Namath was. Um, Carried Southern Comfort and Flask in our boots because Janis Joplin did. We were having sex way too young, I mean like 11, 12, 13. And um, the party had moved on though. The 60s had moved on. It was a strange little in-between generation. So there everybody be on the stoop at 7 in the morning with their long ponytails and leather jackets and upside down buck knives and a lot of them were from tough households and they were tough kids and a lot of them now are dead. And I remember this this guy who was a drug dealer handed me a joint, and he died of cirrhosis of liver 10 years ago. Handed me a joint, hey, okay, my name's Andre Dubus. Up north, Andre Dubus, <laughs> or Doofus. <laughs> and he'd hand, me a, he'd hand me a joint, hey, Dubus, you wanna hit off this joint? Not necessarily, boom! I actually said not necessarily, <laughs> and and I became a, I became, I kept, I became a, a, a peer pressure poster boy. I, I, I was high every day of my sophomore year of high school, and I hated pot. I hated the feeling I got. I got paranoid. I was afraid to say no because I didn't want to get punched. So, you know, I can look at this sometimes in a darkly comic way, but, you know, it's very, very interesting about our, our histories and our memories. Uh, there's a wonderful line, if you've not read Tobias Wolff's, memoir, This Boy's Life, You're In For A Treat. It's just a masterful work. And in that book, Wolf has this line, memory has its own story to tell, right? I'm sure that there were some good times in my youth. There must have been, you know, uh, but I can't remember a lot of them. And so that's instructive. That's not to say they didn't exist, but that what stays with me when I think back to my, my childhood and when I began to write my way into it, and I'll tell you how that happened by accident, um, I have two predominant emotions. And they're, they're physical fear and self-loathing. You know, I was, um, I was a kid who got beat on, and I was a victim, because mainly just because I was kind of bright and wore glasses, and I was always the new kid. And kids are cruel. One or two at a time, they're very nice. Three or four or five, they make the Taliban look like pleasant people. <laughs> I shouldn't joke, but there you go. They can be very cruel. And now I wasn't, I was facing nothing compared to so many young people. I wasn't facing gun violence. I wasn't facing getting shot to death for being on the wrong corner, wearing the wrong colors. But I was physically afraid 
and I hated who I was. And if you know violence yourself, and I'm sure there are people in this room who know physical violence, you, you, you tend to have three general reactions to it. You either fight like hell, or you run like hell, or you freeze. I always froze. I was always the kid who froze. And it took me a while to have insight into that. Well, writing this memoir helped me get insight into it. I think I froze because I was still trying to rationalize. Why is he punching me in the face? I didn't do anything to him. Why is he stomping my glasses? Why is he kicking me in the head? I didn't do any. I did. I even smiled at him. Years later, the summer of 89, sadly, we do not talk about the Tiananmen Square massacre at all as a world culture. It drives me out of my mind. I'm still angry we did the Beijing Olympics, and I think we're doing something again. But for those of you who don't know or don't remember, it was a, it was a revolutionary democratic movement of young, mainly college kids, gathering in the square for social reforms, protesting. The dictator put up with it for about three weeks and then sent in the troops and massacred them, rolled, rolled them down, and then erased the history out of Chinese history books. I've had Chinese um, uh, students since, and they maintain it never happened. And I'm reading a New York Times report of the actual massacre. Now, don't forget, these soldiers are just farm kids from the provinces, the same age as these college kids. And they're following the orders, and they're mowing down their brothers and sisters. And this very charismatic, intelligent leader, 23-year-old young man, was shot to death. And his girlfriend screams at the soldier who did it, why, why, why? And he shoots her dead. And I remember weeping when I read this news report from this British war correspondent. But it got me thinking about innocence. I said, okay, well maybe, maybe that's when you lose your innocence. You don't ask why anymore. Mm -hmm. This world's going to have some brutal bastards in it, and you better kill them before they kill you, or you're going to be dead. And I had that moment come to me um, after, in, you know, if you've read this memoir, forgive me, because I think it's in the, it is in the book. So my mother gets a job down in Boston, 40 miles south. And, and, and I was very proud of what she did, because she deleted the uh, projects and the tenements of slumlords, mainly poor black kids that nobody cared about, uh, they didn't care if they were eating lead paint that was poisoning them for life. So she had the power of the state and she got many death threats from slumlord owners, etc. So she was down in Boston 14 hours a day doing it. Meanwhile, my, little, my older sister, Suzanne, uh, becomes a drug dealer because that's the people who had juice and status in our, in our town. So I'd come home from school. By the way, the school had the seventh worst drug problem in the nation in the 1970s. We had undercover narcotic cops, which was almost comical, because they were <laughs> undercover. They looked like 35-year-old guys with beer guts who needed to shave again by noon. <laughs> they come up and go, hey, you got anything to sell? No! <laughs> walk away. It was just, it was, it was just almost, that was the one, ah, that was funny, that was a funny thing. And, um, and so, I, I, my sister and brother and I, my little sister, went to school every day, but we didn't. We, we would miss 60 to 90 days a year, and we would never get a note home from school. They had 2,500 kids. It was a poor district. They didn't have the resources. Kids fell through the cracks. And when kids fall through the cracks, and so now we're latchkey kids, my mother's gone 14 hours a day. My father lives across the river. Now, my father was not a deadbeat, but he was a he gave you know, a good half of his income, which wasn't much. He was making $7,000 a year when he began teaching at that college as a, as a professor, 7,000. And, um, but we saw him the way a lot of 70s divorced families saw each other. He picked us up for a, a couple hours on Sunday and dropped us off. Not, we never spent the night at his house. So he wasn't around. And I'd come home on those rare days I went to that high school, which is terrifying. And um, there'd be a couple of Harleys in front of the house, and, and uh, inside would be grown men rolling joints on our kitchen table, and the music would be blasting, and I'd go to my room to escape, and there, once there was a skanky drug addict in there with his girlfriend on my bed. I'm 14 years old, so my brother and I built a treehouse in the back of our rented house as a refuge. And if you leave kids alone, what are they going to do? They're going to get high and have sex, and that's what we did. And I believe my brother was 12, and... I, in, he was with this 
12 year old girl, which sounds really disturbing, but they were both children. Somehow her older brother found out about it, and I don't blame him, he didn't like it, but my brother was also a child. And this young man who's 20 years old, 200 pound, six foot military policeman, he comes home on leave ex ex expressly to beat up my little brother. Words out for weeks, he's gonna kill my little brother. I'm terrified, and one day it happens. My, my younger brother Jeb, who had wild Jim Morrison hair and a frizzy, frizzy face, and this, uh, this, he was, he, by the way, I hated him, because if, if, if any girl was interested in me for five minutes, I'd bring her home, she'd meet Jeb, and she'd leave me for him. It happened like four times. I hated him, but he was beautiful, and he had these, he had this uh, knitted uh, vest he'd made out of denim, and, and one day a cat was run over in the middle of the street in the winter. He wore the, he cut off the cat's tail and wore his tie for a while. He's kind of eccentric, but he's also a genius. He taught himself how to play classical guitar, listening to Bach preludes on the record player, figuring out the chords himself. Special kid. He gets dropped off by his teacher from uh, from the eighth grade. And up around the corner comes this, this big man. Now, if you remember, if you guys are old enough, some of you are, in the 70s, nobody had short hair except for cops and military people. And so here he is with his shaved head and little military mustache, and he's, and he's got the hangers on around him, and he just beats my brother mercilessly. And I beg him to stop. I said, Johnny, please, you're next. And I, and I, I became the frozen boy. I froze. Just, oh, I can't wait for you. Just be, hurry up and be over with. Just don't kill him and hurry up. And I didn't do anything because I was terrified. And it was a rare day because my mother was home with the flu. And she comes running out of the house in her nightgown. She picks a stick up off the ground. She starts to swing it at this guy. And he calls her name. I'm not going to repeat, but it's the worst thing you can call this son. And I stood there and did nothing. Finally, it was over. They're laughing and going down the corner and my brother is a bloody tear street snotty mess and he's being helped into the house by his teacher and my mother and I think I don't know if I stood outside um, my house for five minutes or an hour uh, but I I could not detest myself anymore the self-loathing had reached its peak or its depth and eventually I walked into the house and my mother and his teacher are still tending to my brother at the kitchen sink and I, watch in, I walk into the downstairs bathroom and I look at my 14-year-old baby face with the long ponytail and, and I said to it, I don't care if you get killed. I don't care if they stab you to death, shoot you, kick your brains in. You are never going to not fight back ever again. I'm through with you. And I started to do push-ups and sit-ups that night. I got like six push-ups, three sit-ups. I was a small, sedentary child. But after about like a year and a half, I, I had transformed myself. And I didn't get big, but I got a lot stronger. I stopped smoking pot. I stopped drinking. I stopped all bad habits. I stopped hanging around with my friends who were going down a dark road. And some died young. And I joined a boxing gym, and much to my surprise, I had not just athletic ability, but boxing talent. We lived in the woods. We were isolated because there were no men. There were no sports. The first time I touched a basketball, I was 12 years old, and I'd never touched one. I'm in gym class. The coach says, yo, Dubas, dribble it. I thought he meant spit on the ball. <laughs> then I saw these kids bouncing between these cones. I went like this and, you know, went over my head, and I got laughed at and called names. I stayed away from that. So it was a surprise to me, not only did I have athletic ability, but I had boxing talent. So now my brother and I are at a bar in um, Haverhill, Massachusetts. It's the Wild West. We don't need IDs. We're maybe 17, 18, or 16. I don't know. And it's crowded, and there's live music. And this local thug starts to make fun of my brother's slippers and his cat tail tie and his hair, and um, especially his woolen slippers he's wearing at three degrees in February. And uh, this guy was a local thug. He was tall and handsome and had a deep voice, but he was a predator. I would see he was the guy at the high school who would slap the effeminate boy in the face for being effeminate. He would make fun of the fat girl, the kid with the pimples. He, I saw him have a, a kid with cerebral palsy in his wheelchair, pushed him down the hall so fast in the wheelchair the kid was crying, and this guy was laughing. I detested this guy. So my brother was always braver than I was, said, oh yeah, let's go outside. And I was marveling. I'm drinking my milk. 
Because what I'm doing is I'm looking for my first fight. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm marveling at my brother's guts. And just like that, they go out. And then a few minutes later, this guy comes in. I run down, so two, two, two flights of stairs. He had pushed my brother down the stairs. Just pushed him. I go down, hey, you all right, you all right? Yeah, but I lost my slipper. <laughs> I'll get it. I run up and I go to the thug. Meanwhile, imagine, you know, there's a big bouncer here. The thug's at the top of the landing. A lot of music, a lot of people, cigarette smoke noise. I said, hey, my brother lost his slipper when you pushed him down the stairs. His slipper? Your brother's a like, boom! And I knocked his two front teeth down his throat. I kept swinging, and the bouncer kept me from hitting him again, but they were gone. And he was out, and he was down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it felt so good. <laughs> See, this is, this is our problem, my friend. <laughs> She just revealed a lot about herself just now. <laughs> You're among friends. <laughs> no, but the truth is, violence feels good. And frankly, it's easier to do it than not. And, the, and it became a very dark road. I did it for like 10 years. I would go, now d d please understand, I hate violence. Um, I especially hate bullies and cruelty and injustice. So I could only get in a fight if I could morally defend it. So, but sadly, it was not hard to find trouble that you could get into. I go to a bar, wait for some guy to slap his girlfriend, and I put him in the hospital. I go to a house party, and so there's a gang of guys that go around, three guys on one. I jump them all. And, and, and I got beat up a few times, and not nearly as, as much as I should have. I was arrested a few times, and I got to, I, I be, after like, Two or three years of this, I had a reputation as a, as a tough kid. This was heaven to me. This was, this is heaven from the God. Me? Yeah, I do, but it's careful, I'll kick your ass. That was, nothing sounded better to me than those words. Women were paying attention to me who weren't paying attention before. And the Haverhill police love me! Because I am wailing on guys they want to, but can't without losing their, their badges. Yet, this little voice that we all have, right, if you look at the word intuition, I don't know if it's a Greek or Latin root, but I love this word. You know what the archaic definition of that is? It means to watch over or to guard. And that little voice inside me knew I was on a really bad road. I was going to get killed doing this, or maybe worse, I was going to kill someone doing this. So I started to box as a way to control my violence. Well, I know I'm not afraid to fight anymore. What I'm afraid to do is stop fighting. So I'm going to just be a boxer. I'll stop going to bars and house parties where there's trouble. I'll stay out of these neighborhoods I grew up in. I'll just be an athlete, a pugilist, and I'll, and I'll dedicate myself to something higher. And I'm working...